let's hit the record button. Yeah, we did. Perfect. Okay. All right. So we're going to record this session as well. Uh, we did that for yesterday too. Um, I'm going to just jump in Paint Shop Pro. I've got no specific. Uh, I mean, I can do a, an hour-long uh, demo on this, but I don't use any need to for this particular group. But I want to show a couple of the tools, a couple of features in the application that I think you might be able to use if there's something specific you want to see in the application or whether or not I can do it, just uh, feel free to pipe up and let me know. Uh, Paint Shop Pro basically starts off with three tabs across the top. So you have a Manage tab, an Adjust tab, and an Edit tab. On the Manage tab, I can get information about the image, such as the EXIF data, uh, all the metadata that's associated to that. Um, we also have the ability to adding uh, keywords and, and tagging it. You can have multiple keywords. You can sort by keywords. So, for example, if you uh, have a, you may want to have a keyword. Um, oh, I don't know, bud can or cans, bottles. Um, maybe a particular um, uh, a brand of, of, of beer and that sort of thing. So you can certainly add these keywords, sort by it. You can also give them ratings on a scale of one to five, and then sort by. Show me all of the five star rating. Uh, images and you'll be able to see those in the tray. Um, also in the manage mode, not really appropriate for this group I don't think, but certainly for the, the personal life and whatnot, uh, we have the ability to tag it with GPS coordinates on these images, which is kind of cool. So I've taken a couple of shots while I'm down here. When I go back to Ottawa, I can post these images on my Facebook page or wherever the case may be, and they can actually see it right on the map. Um, so anything that has a it has a map mode in here. So if I select a specific image uh, that has GP, a GPS tagging on it, it will actually uh, bring up the map and uh, and show it to me on the map. It's using Google Map for that, uh, which is kind of neat. It's, I should have done that because it's a little bit slow. So uh, the next tab over is the Adjust tab, and I really shouldn't have done that. So the next tab over is the uh, Adjust tab. Here I can do some very quick adjustments to images. Um, I've downloaded a whole bunch of images that I shot last night. There's a number of people that have red eye, uh, that sort of thing, very quickly uh, go through here and fix up red eye and that sort of stuff. Um, adjusting the tone curves, uh, increasing saturation, and that sort of thing. There's also a number of different effects in here. Artistic effects, black and white effects, portrait, uh, and we can go through and simply double click on one to apply that particular effect to the image. So again, very quick and very easy to go through there. On the edit tab is where the bulk of the work is going to take place. When you first get um, PaintShop Pro installed, and as I say, I've got cards here. Um, after I finish, I guess we're going to take a lunch break or something like that. Come on up here. I'll leave the pile here. Uh, if you would want to grab one and uh, You'll install this, download the trial from Corel.com of the standard edition, and then use the serial number on this tag. We'll give you a full copy. That's about a $79 product. Um, so when you do install it and get it running <clears throat> from your Edit tab, you would click on Browse More Photos, or, or More Folders, rather, and then Browse to where your content is. Once you've done that, you'll see the entire folder structure appear on the left-hand side. And I can actually go through into these various folders and take a look at some of the images that I have in here. Uh, so some of the some of the features, I'm just going to go through some of these fairly quick. And if you have any questions, just uh, pop up your hand sort of thing. Excuse uh, <coughs> <to> me. <coughs> Sorry about that. If you, um, if you have a number of uh, prints or images that you've printed out, uh, and then maybe scanned in, you want to digitize them and bring them into, uh, into PaintShop Pro and repurpose them. Uh, sometimes you'll, tip or you'll typically scan an image in, uh, bring it in, and then go scan another one and this sort of thing. In PaintShop Pro, we can lay all four images down on the scanner pattern and scan them all at the same time, or any number of images actually. And with the crop tool, again, most applications have a crop tool. It's simply a matter of clicking and dragging, selecting the area. Nothing special here. In PaintShop Pro, we have this icon, and what that will do is it will actually crop that object for me, save the file, keep the file open, and then turn around and open up the original file again. And so that allows me to very quickly go through a whole series of images and crop out exactly what I need. And it's automatically bringing up the previous one for me. So it makes it a lot easier to crop your images. Now, sometimes if you close the lid on the scanner, your image will shift. 
Now, because I've, I've, I've cropped these other three, I no longer need the, uh, this image back up again, so I'm just going to click on this icon, and what that'll do is it will crop it, throw that away, or not throw it away, but it will not bring it back up, so I'll be able to continue using it. One of the other tools we have is, is an image straightening tool. And with the image straightening tool, I'm just going to zoom into this. All I need to do is position this line on what should be perfectly horizontal. Once I get that, I'll click on the checkbox. It's automatically going to rotate the image for me, and it will crop around there. Let me just zoom out a little bit. And you can see you just have to come back here and do a little bit more cropping just to, to clean that up. But very quick and very easy, I'm able to uh, take these images and crop them. Um, fill flash, uh, fill flash typically, or fill flash situation or backlight situation typically happens if you're taking a shot of somebody in a doorway or be in front of a, a window with bright light coming in. So you'll get the darkness in the face if you're not using a flash. Um, in the uh, adjust menu, we've got something called fill flash. And very quick and very easy, I can lighten up this image and get more detail in there. So it's a great little tool to, uh, uh, to do that sort of thing. One of the nice things about PaintShop Pro is that it does support layers. It also supports PSD files. So if you have Photoshop, you can bring Photoshop files into PaintShop Pro. I can also save it out as a PSD or as an EPS and, uh, and bring them in. The um, filter format or file format formats that are available, you can see there's quite a list of them uh, that we can output to. Native, uh, the native format is, is called a PS image. And as I say, it does maintain layers. So it's also great for uh, you know, doing some file conversions and that sort of thing. The, um, <clears throat> the next one is perspective correction. I think this is pretty cool. Let me just show you the uh, straighten tool on this one. I've shown you the straighten tool on a horizontal. Uh, this is on a vertical object. So again, we can actually take this line, drag and drop that, to where it should be perfectly straight up and down and fix the issue that the photographer did when he took this shot. So very quick, very easy. It's rotated it. It's also cropped it at the same time, so it saved me a couple of steps. This one is pretty cool. It's um, perspective correction. So I'm at a street level looking up at a second story window, and I want to get rid of this distortion. What I do with this is I'll simply move these four nodes to the four corners, or what should be, if I'm looking at it square on. Simple as that, and I click my check mark, and there it is. I'm looking directly at the, uh, the image now. It's pretty cool. Uh, this is a shot I took downtown Ottawa. Uh, same sort of thing. I was on the street looking straight up at it. And again, mark off what should be perfectly straight up and down. And that's, uh, that's all there is to it. So very quick and very easy to use. Sometimes you may want to take an image that has a specific, uh, well, this, this one here is fairly good focus. This is um, uh, shot by one of my former colleagues. It's down in Newfoundland, um, Maritara, East Coast. And um, she took this shot. I want to do a, what we call a selective focus. So I have the ability of taking a certain area and keeping that in sharp focus and throw the rest of it completely out of focus. If I go to my effects menu down to photo effects, and here I have selective focus. In the selective focus, there's uh, a couple of different methods I can do. I can do a linear or I can do an elliptical or radial. It's kind of hard to see on screen. Let me just see if I can make this a little bit bigger. In here I have the ability of taking these <clears throat> Excuse me, taking these icons and I can rotate these. And I can indicate the area that I want to have in sharp focus. I also have the ability in here to pump up the saturation. And what I'm doing basically is I'm taking this image and making it look more like a tilt shift, if you're familiar with that term. It makes it look like a toy uh, model. I need a little bit more feathering on this. So I'm going to pull that out a little bit. A lot of these dialog boxes will have this check mark in the upper right hand corner, preview on image, so I'm actually seeing the effects live as I'm doing this. So it makes it a lot easier 
to see the uh, the type of effect that I can achieve. So there, there we have that image. It's thrown completely, completely out and uh, sort of makes it look like a little bit of a model set. With the elliptical, in here I can indicate the area that I want in sharp focus. And as I mentioned, I can set the, the amount of, of fade and, and dissolve, that sort of thing. Uh, I can also bump up the saturation on this particular image. I might want to bring the saturation rate down because I don't want that color shift on it. And so it's just simply a matter of clicking OK. So very easy to use uh, application. Um, anybody here do genealogy? have old photographs that you want to clean up and make them look good. Um, one of the features in um, PaintShop Pro is called Fade Correction. It happens very quick. To get to Fade Correction, we go through the Learning Center. So if you remember F10, then you're all set to go. Uh, F10 will launch the Learning Center. And let me just close off my Materials palette. Anytime I want to open up other palettes in, in uh, PaintShop Pro, simply right click and I can select whatever palettes I want. Now the Learning Center is the place to go if you're just starting with the application for the first time, you want to learn more about it. Um, it allows you to um, learn, take a look at the tool and it'll show you exactly how to use it. It's organized in a logical fashion. You want to get your photos, you want to do some quick adjustments. Those quick adjustments could be rotating, could be cropping, uh, fixing red eye, that sort of thing. Retouch and restore. Uh, layers and selections of dealing with additional objects and putting objects on it. Uh, text and graphics, you've got effects, advanced adjustments, and then of course uh, print and share. Uh, another nice thing about the Learning Center is if I'm over here and I'm looking at this tool, I'm like, what is that? I'll click on this tool, Learning Center automatically changes and now tells me what that tool is and how to use it. So it's a great way to learn the application. If I need to get back to my home base in the center, I'm just going to click on the house. It takes me there. I'm going to go to Retouch and Restore. And I'll just bring up this image. So here's an image of probably mid to late 60s. I want to fix this up. Fade correction, this happens very quick. Don't blink. And there you have it. Um, really pump up the image nicely. I can adjust the uh, amount of correction that it does. Make it fairly minor. Or really bring it up and really bring out that color. So very, very quick. Here's an indoor shot that was taken at a, at a wedding. So you've got the atmosphere of haze, whatever you want to call it. You've got the type of lighting. I'm up in the balcony. I didn't shoot this, but photographers up in the balcony and, and, and shooting down. Again, fade correction, very quick and very easy just to pump that image right up. We'll open up to do one final one. Bang. Done. Okay. So it's, it's a great little tool to fix up those faded photographs and, and, and do that sort of thing. Uh, the next one is Color Changer. I mentioned Color Changer to you guys yesterday for the Lime Marita and the uh, Cran Burita, I guess it is. Yes, Cran Burita. Um, I tried it this morning. It's not very effective for that particular image because uh, the, well, the image that I have of the Lime Marita is may, maybe not the same one as you guys are playing with. That's the one I was playing with right here, and it really did not work well. Uh, I've actually taken this image and I've knocked out the background from it. I've knocked out the can. I think I actually dropped it in the Dropbox there a couple weeks back. And I can show you how I did that. I did it in PaintShop Pro very quickly, very easy. I'll get to that in a minute. But right now I want to talk about the color changer. Color changer allows me to take an object and change the color. Now you can certainly mask off the area and adjust the hue change it more cyan, more magenta, you know, change the hue like that, uh, increase the saturation, do all that sort of stuff, but it's a long, tedious process. If I grab my color changer tool, which is underneath the flood fill, automatically my materials palette opens up, and I'm going to click on the color that I want to change. That's all I do. Up here I can adjust my tolerance. My tolerance is a little bit low on this, and now it's way too high. There we go. And I can now come around here and click on whatever color I want. So if I'm doing interior decorating, maybe I've got a, um, I'm doing a, um, uh, a poster and it's a, um, uh, a beach party and I've got girls in red and blue bikinis and I want to make them yellow and green. Click, click, click and you're done. So very quickly, no, not with this tool. 
<laughs> uh, so as you can see, very quick and very easy to, to do that. If I have a situation like this, I want to take this young girl's headscarf and I want to change that a different color, but I don't want to affect this. In that scenario, what I would do is I'd use my masking tools. And I'm just going to grab my freehand selection tool. I'll mask the area. I will mask the area. I will mask the area. Thank you. And then I'm going to use my color changer to go ahead and change the color of that, make it whatever color I want, and then from the selection menu just select none and that will remove the selection. So color changer tool, way cool. That shot of Todd with the green shirt, it's blue. It, you make all the shirts green, absolutely. Sorry Todd. <laughs> um, so again, color changer, fun little tool, very quick and very easy to use. Uh, if it doesn't grab all of the color, I can click in here again to add more, or I can adjust my tolerance up a bit, and that will look after that. There you go. Now, it didn't do here, and that's where I would adjust my tolerance or click it again. Correct, correct. Yeah, the question was uh, to, to zoom in to see if there was a halo or pixels that were missed. Uh, if they are missed, then it's just a matter of clicking on them again. So there we have that image, and I, I can now go through and change it to whatever color I want, like that. No, sir, no. No, the, the way it selects the color is by hue, I guess, by, by pixel value, color value of that particular pixel, and then it selects the surrounding pixels based on the tolerance. So if I select these sheets, drop my tolerance right down. Yeah, no, it's, let me just undo this one completely. There we go. If I select the duvet cover here, I'll click on that. Now you see it hasn't got all of it, and that's because my tolerance is quite low. So I can do two things. I can click on this area once again until I get it all or it's just a matter of pumping up the tolerance a little bit, and that will get it. So it's based on the color value, and then now it knows what color value I'm changing, I'm now telling it what color I want to change it to. Simple as that. So very quick and very easy. Um, we, we took a, an image, and uh, that was an old image, and made it look new with the fade correction. We're going to go the opposite direction. PaintShop Pro is a unique application, and it's, all, it's the only application on the market that actually gives you a bit of a history uh, lesson in photography when you're, when you're playing with this particular tool. Um, if I go to uh, Retouch and Restore, no, I don't want to go there. I want to go to, come on, <coughs> Effects, and then Time Machine. Let's grab the other image. So this is a shot that I took uh, with the Tall Ships visit uh, in the Kingston area this past summer. And I went out there and I went on board with 13 different ones. It was kind of, kind of cool. But uh, this particular shot, um, 1839 is the old daguerreotype photography, also called tintypes. They were images that were printed on metal. Um, you can get that type of effect with or without the, the frame around it. Uh, the next one over is uh, Albumen. Albumin is typically done with egg and, uh, and silver halide, so that's how that process was put together. Cyanotype, and of course it tells me down here a little bit about it. That's a little bit of a novelty, I guess. My favorite is the platinum, and the nice thing about it is, is as I say, is the frame really adds character to the image itself. And uh, anybody remembers the monsters, we can Get the old Munster's house going on here. Sorry? I have no idea. No idea. These are uh, sample images we've been playing with. I've been playing with this particular image for three or four years now. All right. Background eraser tool. Uh, this is a phenomenal tool. It's a great way to knock objects out or knock backgrounds out. I'm just going to go to my Windows menu. You can see that I have quite a few windows open right now. Uh, 
it's not, uh, we've done a lot of changes in X6 over X5. X5, we, we said, don't open any more than about 10, in, 10 images. You can, but it might be a little bit slower. In X6, we, we've removed that limit completely. So you can see I've got quite a few open. Um, I want to uh, close these off. So close all. If I've done a lot of work to my images, I can simply click on Save Selected, and it will save all my images for me in one shot. I don't have to go to Save each time. So I'm going to simply click on Close All. I'm going to open up this image and this one. And you'll notice I have um, window view here from my window menu. I can select uh, tabbed view. And so I can toggle back and forth from them here. On this image, Control A to select everything, Control C to copy. And now I'm going to go to my background and Control V to paste. Simple as that. So if I was to open up my layers palette, you would see the two, two objects there. Under the eraser tool, is my background eraser. When I take a look at this cursor, I'm just going to zoom in a bit. The cursor looks like a pencil. That black tip, if the black tip touches my object, it's going to erase it. If the ellipse around it touches the object, I don't have an issue. Hold the Alt key down to increase the size, or I could use the interactive property bar up here. And I'm simply going to click around here, Actually, let me do an undo because of this little piece up here. And I'm simply going to go around here very quickly. Let go of the mouse button a couple of times, and that way if I accidentally go into it, I just do a control Z and I don't have to start all over again. And let's come up over here. And I'll zoom out a bit, make sure I have the top done. There we go. I'm going to zoom into this area right here. We can still see that antenna. So it hasn't wiped it out. Okay. Very quick, very easy. Let me open up this one. And what I'm going to do with this is I'm just going to move around here. Now, I'm not being super, super critical with, the, with it, but you, you get the idea. Oops, now I need a control Z in there. So my tolerance in here, I want to adjust the tolerance, make it a little bit, uh, but very quick and very easy. Go around there, I can do the inside as well. And I can go through the entire thing and basically uh, cut out the background. I'm not going to spend too much more time on this, but you get the idea. And let me hold the Alt key down, increase my brush size. And I got a little bit too close to the cam there. But you get the idea. Okay? Very quick and very easy. And it works well. I mean, the, the contrasting colors in this particular image, the background uh, and then the glass itself are fairly close. If you had a dark brown beer bottle on a lighter background, that would snap out like a, like a or pop out like a snap. You know, it would be very quick and very easy to, uh, to get that out of there. Uh, so that's the, um, the background eraser. The next one you were talking about here is the, uh, the bride cat. <laughs> So uh, this one is called Smart Carver, and it's actually pretty cool. Uh, this allows me to take objects out of the image without interfering with the background. So what I'm going to do here is, uh, with this image that I shot about two years ago, neighbor across the street, I was down at her wedding in Jamaica. Um, from the image menu, go down to Smart Carver. A lot of these um, labs that I'm going into, a lot of these features I'm going into, bring up this little bit of, uh, this little palette. We call them one, two, three palettes. And in most cases, it's one, two, three. Three simple steps on how to use that tool. This is no different. I can turn that off if I don't want to see it again. Simply close it. So here's the image. First thing I want to do is I'm going to mark off the area that I want to remove. Now I took this shot. I thought it was pretty cool, but I didn't like the balloons here. So I'm going to mark off those balloons. You see how critical I am, how careful I am at selecting just that area? 
not very. This tree I don't want, so I'm going to mark off that tree as well. Anytime we're going to remove an object from the image, if that object I'm removing is close to the back, uh, close to the object that I want to keep, I need to be able to protect that object. So what I'll do is I'm going to grab my preserve brush, and I'm just going to do a small stroke down here. I'll do another stroke down here. And all that does is when I contract this uh, uh, horizontally, it's going to squeeze it in, but it's not going to interfere with my, my, my subject in the image. And now it's simply a matter of clicking on this icon, and it's done. Sometimes if there's a bit of a background uh, issue, I can click on Background Fusion. It will fix that. I'll click OK, and it return me, it's now returned me back into PaintShop Pro, where I can see my image. Tree's gone. I don't have an issue in here. I don't have my balloons there either. Any questions on that one? Yes. Yes, it folds it in now in the image, uh, in the image, um, our smart carver. After I've folded it in, I can, if I wanted to, I can expand it back out if I have a constraint of specific dimensions, but you can certainly bring it back out. It just depends on your, on your needs. Yes, is there a question? No, there. They should be seeing it. Show my screen on air. Showing screen. Uh, you're seeing the screen right here. Is there, if there's anybody online, could you type into the question panel? Let me know if you're seeing this all right. I've got 24 people online. Yeah, and I have a question pop in here. Just a second now. Perfect. Okay, thanks, Tom. All right. Uh, cat's just being a troublemaker. All right. <laughs> so, next thing I want to talk about is HDR zing. <laughs> All right. Anybody here know what HDR is? on you photography buffs. HDR is high dynamic range. Okay. Basically what it is, is it allow, HDR allows you to, to take what we call bracketed shots. So I'm going to take a shot that is typically two shots underexposed, one or two shots, uh, I want, sorry, stops. One or two stops underexposed, normal exposure, and then overexposure. And the idea behind it, if I was to take a shot here right now with the proper exposure, there's very little light here, there's uh, a lot of light coming in the windows, and I want to level all these out. So where it's dark, I want to bring up the light. Where it's bright, I want to tone it down a bit. You see the detail in the shadows. So we can certainly do that with the HDR. And so I'm going to select these three images. Right click, HDR, Exposure Merge. <clears throat> what this is going to do is it's going to launch the uh, HDR Merge window. And again, my one, two, three. Now, if I take a look at the, let's just let this finish processing. This is my underexposure. So you can see I've got nice detail in the lighted areas. I've got no detail in the shadow. In the overexposed areas, I have the detail in the shadow area. My lights are totally washed out. And then normal exposure, a little bit on the dark side. So what we can do is select these elements. I'm going to click on process or process. What do you guys say? Process? OK, we say process. It's Canadian, eh? What's that? Pooched, yes. <clears throat> so here's the image. I've already done the merge. I have the ability to, uh, we have a couple of different presets, more for artistic type stuff that you can play around with. So it's kind of cool. I can adjust the temperature. I can change the tint contrast, a number of different things, uh, just to get that, that type of look that I'm looking for. Once I'm done, I'll just click on Process again, and it will uh, save that file for me. Uh, we can also do a single HDR merge. 
Uh, I'm on the back of a motorbike going down PCH1. I've taken this shot that looks pretty cool, but the lighting is kind of wonky. If I am using um, uh, RAW, and it will only work with RAW images, if I'm using a RAW image, it, it, sorry, it, can, um, it can take that RAW image and actually extrapolate the one stop under, two stops under, norm, normal exposure and overexposure. Um, the next one is Photo Blend. I'm going to play with these images here. So what Photo Blend does is it allows you to take multiple images and put them all into one. So for example, I'm doing a family portrait and I've got, um, or let's say I've got a beach scene. Two shots of a beach scene, different people in them. I want to bring this person from this shot and I want to put them in this image here. I can certainly do that with the photo blend. If you're doing a family portrait and the dog's looking away or little Jimmy's picking his nose, you take a couple of shots, then you can mix and match, change the heads around and do all that sort of stuff. Well, that's what I'm gonna do here now. It's called photo blend. I'm gonna click on close. So here's a couple of shots that I took. That's uh, my granddaughter there. So we're gonna take this and what I wanna do is I wanna brush in the areas that I wanna protect. So I'm going to pick up here. I'll go to the next shot. It's a real ham. Come down here. And you can see I'm not overly critical in here about grabbing stuff and worrying about the background. Let's grab baby. and then the final image. Now, typically, if you know that you're going to be potentially having to do this in an image, it's always best, of course, to use a tripod. Otherwise, your background's going to be shifting and it can cause real problems. In this particular one, you'll notice that I do have a bit of a shift there. If that sort of thing happens, all you need to do is select the image that you want to use as your background, and this one seems to be fairly stable, and then click on this lock right down here in the bottom corner. And what that will do is that will uh, say, this is the image I'm gonna use as my background. I now click on my process, and in a matter of seconds, it's going to go through there and create a neat little image that I can give to her mother and have fun with it. Okay. <clears throat> now we do have a problem. I don't know if I click that lock properly, but or maybe I grabbed the wrong image, but that's the type of effect you're going to get if you have camera movement when you're taking the shots. <laughs> I'm sorry? Uh, I've done eight. I've done eight. I'm sorry? Oh, uh, probably yes, I think so. Yeah. 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 Close that off. Um, last one I'm going to show you is uh, makeover, although I don't know. I mean, it's not really. It's more for, for fun. Um, the ultimate version has a, uh, an application in it called um, face filter. Allows you to completely, well here for example, this is the same image. Uh, that's the after and that's the before. I'm sorry? Yes, that can certainly be done. Uh, in the makeover tools, and I'll talk about that right now. So here we have this bride. If I select my makeover tools, we have something called Finify. Yes. So I'll click on that and just move. Oops, I did it the wrong way. That's all I'm doing. I'm clicking and dragging. Okay. Um, I'm going to grab this image here. All right. Uh, in the makeup uh, bag, we have tools such as blemish fixer, toothbrush, eye whitener for a lot of the people in here this morning, uh, also suntan, and then, of course, the Thinify. Now, you're probably all aware of clone tools and how a clone tool works. Typically, when you clone, you copy your uh, color values and textures from one area and drop it into another. 
With the blemish fixer, it does just that. But what it's doing is it's copying the texture from the surrounding circle and dumping it into the center circle. So holding the Alt key down, I'm going to make this a little bit smaller, and a single click right there will remove that. Let's do that again. So I can very quickly go around the image and get rid of all the blemishes. It also work, will also work on hot spots. So if the flash, a bit of an oil on the skin caught the flash, then you can tone that down with that a little bit. So again, very quick and very easy to go around there and uh, just clean those up. Teeth whitener, adjust the toothbrush, and just sim single click, and that will whiten the teeth. Okay? Sometimes if your strength is a little bit too much, you'll end up with what looks like calamine. <laughs> But uh, so very quick and very easy. Red eye tool. And then I can go back to my makeover tools. Here's my eye whitener. Single click in here. Just brightens up the whiteness of the eyes quite nicely. Okay. I'll take this one here. We're going to take, I'm sorry. He did. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to take this to. Um, I'm going to take this image here. And we're going to do a couple of. Uh, um, of uh, I'll show you a couple of the tools that we've done already. I'm going to apply those. Who so pay attention? So first thing I want to do is that is I'm going to crop this. Um, with respect to cropping, one thing you may notice is that I have this grid in the crop tool. That's the rule of thirds or the golden rule uh, that basically dictates position your main focal point within that third quadrant, and it would be a more appealing looking image. So if I took this image, for example, and I resize this, and I can turn that grid on or off if I wanted to, I'm going to position that right through the eyes. And let me make it a little bit smaller. That's the area that I want, and I'll simply click OK. So we crop that down, and let me do that again. I don't want this white over here. OK, so there's our image. Next thing I want to do with this is we, we've looked at the makeover tool already, so just very quickly uh, go in here. Again, hold the Alt key down to resize my brush. Very quickly, I can, go, I can do that. I have a local sharpening tool, so I can go over the eyebrows and sharpen those a little bit. It'll bring those up uh, quite a bit nicer. But what I'm going to do here is just for the, for the fun of it, I'm going to use my uh, color changer tool, and I'm going to change her eye color. So if we right click, oh, actually, I got my layers palette opened up already. So I'm going to create a new layer. And I'm going to zoom in. Grab my paintbrush, and I'll just reduce the size of this. And now I'm on a separate layer, and all I'm doing is I'm just painting around the iris, but that is on a separate layer. Now, within uh, Paint Shop Pro, as other uh, raster editing applications, we have the ability of changing what we call merge modes. And there's a number of different types of modes within the, uh, the Paint Shop Pro. I'm going to grab color. And then I can adjust the opacity of this. Now I'm going to grab my eraser tool because I just noticed that that's up into the eye. I lit a little bit here. I'm on a separate layer. Let me zoom out a bit. And now the other tool you've seen already is the color changer tool. So I'm simply going to click on the eyes. And now I can come through here and change her eyes to whatever color I want. Give her blue eyes, give her green eyes, whatever color. You can do the same sort of thing with hair. You see some of these young girls, they have the, the hair with a pink streak in it. Very easy just to do a, a stroke of paint on a layer and then change that to pink, and it will affect uh, the, uh, the hair in that way. I'm going to add one more layer. And I'm going to give her some lipstick. why my wife won't let me play with her lipstick. 
<laughs> I knew they'd get you. Yeah. All right. We'll talk later. Uh, <laughs> all right. So again, color changer. Uh, grab the color. I can click on a lighter pink or whatever color I want, and it will actually uh, change that for me. I think it's taking a bit of a pause right now. Here we go. Now, if I wanted to make this a little bit darker, of course, I'm just going to reduce the or increase, uh, reduce the, uh, the the transparency of that. I mean, that to me is not very appealing right now. You want red, red, red? I don't know that I can do that. I can try it. <laughs> all right, for those online that didn't hear that, <laughs> all right, so yeah, so I just play with the tolerance and that sort of thing. <laughs> oh, can I stop now? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm looking at time and other stuff I want to show, but we'll, we'll give you your brunette later on. All right, so um, now what I'm going to do is go back to the, uh, the background. I've now selected my main layer from my effects menu to photo effects and film and filters. We've got all kinds of filters in here that I can apply, whether it be cut color tinting, um, soft focus, a variety of different things. Here I can apply a, uh, a glamour filter. I can change the color, make it sort of like a champagne color. Um, any number of things. I can also increase the density of this particular filter. And so it's going to add a little bit of a warmish glow to that. I'll click OK. And there is my final image. Oh, one, one more thing I might want to do with this is, again, effects, photo effects, select a focus, grab my ellipse, and then I'm going to take this and rotate that, change the size, and get just the area that I want to have in sharp focus. And that's a little bit too much. Anyway, so you get the you get the idea there. Okay, any questions on any of that? Okay, that's, uh, that's about it for uh, Paint Shop Pro. Oh, one more thing to, to mention. When we do save a file out, it's a non, these are non-destructive editing, which basically means when I go to save that file out, if I look in the folder where I've saved the file, I'm going to see a hidden folder called Corel Photo Paint, I think it's called, or something like that. And in there are the originals of any of the images that I've modified. So it's a great way to go back and, uh, and uh, get that, uh, you know, if I have to fall back on that image. And that's a feature that can be turned on or off. Um, <clears throat> masking, of course, it'll support masking, as I've mentioned, uh, Photoshop layers and that sort of thing. The output from this, uh, to be very honest with you, is very restrictive. Um, so if you want to output from here, I'd probably do it as a file and take it to another application and output. Um, this is, I mean, this is a, a home user type application, but certainly a lot of professionals are using it as well. All right, I'm going to close down uh, Paint Shop Pro. If there's no more questions here, or do we do we have any questions online? I'm not seeing any questions at all, so that's fine. Perfect. Okay, so let's close down Corel Draw, uh, uh, Pro rather, and I'm going to go into Corel Draw. So, the file that I'm actually looking at right now is the one that uh, was shared, and it's called uh, it's called TMS 2014. I'm going to go into Page Sorter View. I've called it the Basics of Corel Draw. Never mind the title. Um, you guys are well seasoned in Corel Draw. Some of you, some of you guys are newer to Draw. Uh, some of you haven't used X6. Uh, I'm going to go through here. If you find what I'm showing you is too basic, then please speak up. If it's too advanced, then tell me to you know 
me explain that more uh, because I'm here for you guys and to give you the information that, uh, that I, I'm thinking you need. Um, and I've been wrong once before. So um, the CorelDRAW interface, there's no real need to talk about that. I guess one of the main things to, to mention, though, is the Windows menu, Dockers, and there are a number of different Dockers in here that can help you do your job a lot quicker, a lot easier. You guys use uh, Dockers already in the form of your object manager, and yesterday we showed the, uh, the object styles, Docker, and uh, some other Dockers. We'll be covering some more today. Um, Justin, time-wise, what do I have until 1130? Okay. Okay. So I'm going to do this as a very high level because there are some some things that I want to cover specifically in here. Uh, the first one would be uh, workspace customization, and the reason I say that is because, and I've shown this stuff before to those that were here last year, but I think if you customize your interface, it can really save a lot of time uh, when you're working on files and that sort of thing. Some of the customization I do are creating toolbars, creating custom toolbars. I showed yesterday how you can create a toolbar to convert an object to a bitmap. If I hold down the Control plus Alt key, click on my bitmap menu, it doesn't have to be accessible. This is grayed out right now, but all I need to do is take this icon and drag and drop it on my interface. I also do fit text to path quite a bit. So again, I'm going to go to my text menu, hold the Control plus Alt key down, drag and drop it onto the same toolbar. I can take this toolbar and I can dock it anywhere I want on the screen. I can also rename this if I want to. So I can have one toolbar called um, Banners, where these are the tools I use specifically for banners. And I can turn these tools on and off. If I right click here, I can select whichever toolbar I want to appear on the screen. So you right click anywhere on a blank area and it will allow you to uh, access various toolbars. Double-clicking the bar at the top will dock them. And then, of course, by default, CorelDRAW X6, we have locked all toolbars, so you can't move them. We had a number of customers, uh, low-end users, unlike yourselves, that would take a toolbar off, and then they call up the support line saying, I don't have my standard toolbar, I can't find it. So right-click, select your standard toolbar or whatever toolbar you want to select, and it will bring it, uh, bring it right back up. But, uh, so what we've done is we've locked it you'll need to right click and select lock toolbars and that will toggle that off. Now I have the ability of taking any of these toolbars and moving them wherever I want to. If I double click this bar, it's going to snap it right back up to where it belongs. So I can go through, I do contour because I do contour cutting quite a bit. Control plus Alt key, click and drag. I'm going to drop that at the end of this menu, the center or at the beginning so I can dictate where I want that in there. Other customization you may want to do from tools down to customization. I'm going to go into commands. And in here I have the ability of customizing various commands and shortcut keys. You'll notice if I click on my view menu, I have no shortcut keys for wireframe or enhanced. I'm quite often tracing bitmaps. So I want to clean up these bitmaps. It's an awful lot easier to clean up a bitmap if you're in wireframe mode. Sorry, a converted bitmap if you're in wireframe mode. So I want a keyboard shortcut for wireframe. I'm going to click on wireframe, and it automatically jumps me right to that position. In here, I'll click on the shortcut key tab, and I will use the letter W, and I click Assign. To get out of wireframe, I have to go back to Enhanced View. I'm going to use the letter Q for Enhanced View. The reason I do that is because Q and W are side by side on the keyboard. It's very easy to very quickly toggle back and forth between wireframe and enhanced. Okay, rather than going over to the E. The E is used for even alignment, so it's already used anyway. And another way to remember the Q is you're quitting wireframe. So I'll go to my enhanced, I'm going to assign the letter Q, and I'll click assign. Uh, I use, uh, I create multiple page documents many, many times. Uh, go into page sorter view. Keyboard shortcut I use for that is the letter S, and I'll click assign. Grouping and ungrouping is control U, control G. You could make it the letter U and the letter G. We all use break apart quite a bit. Control K. Just use the letter K. It's a lot quicker to hit a single key than have to stretch your hand across the keyboard and grab two of them. So if you're breaking apart drop shadow, if you're breaking apart text, 
or you're breaking apart curved elements, uh, the letter K will do that for you. And uh, break apart is in the arrange menu, so just go to the arrange menu and you'll find break apart in here. And we give it a shortcut key, you see it's already control K. I just want the K, assign, and then OK. I don't necessarily have to delete that, although I could. You'll notice now if I go to my view menu, it's actually added those keyboard shortcuts for me. So if I forget what they are because I've just created them, then I can always look in the menu. And I'm going back and forth from QW. You can't see it that quick on, on, online on screen here, simply because we're, I'm streaming it over the internet. But you can see that uh, you can very quickly toggle back and forth if you need the shape tool. Once I've done all that customization, if I'm in a graphic shop and I've got, say, three systems that I use quite regularly, and I want to move from one system to the other system, from my tools menu down to options, I'm going to highlight workspace, and here I have the ability to export the workspace. I can export it, and it's going to create an XS, XSPT file, I think. Um, XSLT. Uh, it'll create an XSLT file, and I can then email that to myself or thumb drive and move it over to the other system and import it. And I'll have all the customization on that system as well. Um, no, it will not. So the color palettes uh, are, are basically part of the application. It's not part of the customizable workspace. Now, when you're talking uh, extra color palettes, you're referring to the document palette or your RGB CMYK palettes. No, it will not take that with it. Yeah. No. All right, let's just close that off. Uh, page setup, there's no need to, uh, to go into that. I was talking to uh, Dave earlier on, and what he's done for himself is, uh, and I'll just mention this one thing, uh, if we go File New, you'll see that there are a number of page sizes in here. Dollars to Donuts, you guys probably use one or two of these, whereas in most cases they're all custom page sizes. So take that custom page size and create a default. Okay. The other thing I should probably mention about new documents, creating new documents, and this goes to file complexity and printing problems. When you create a new document, I'm going to create this document right now, and what you can see here is that primary color mode is CMYK, and that's what we all want. Rendering resolution is 300 dpi. The rendering resolution is used anytime I create a transparency, when I create a lens or a drop shadow. Those are rendered out at 300 dpi. For the most part, you guys shoot at 200 dpi. You don't need a 300 dpi resolution in here. So if I take a, a bud bottle or a can or a, a logo or a piece of text and I give it a drop shadow, if my artwork is 56 dpi or it's, it's 150 dpi, my drop shadow is going to be 300 dpi. Because the rendering resolution is 300 dpi. If I don't flatten that image and I don't make them the same resolution, if you were to grab a loop and you take a look at that, it's kind of hard to, to explain or to show it online. With the, um, it's going to create scan lines So this is the edge of an object. This is simulated. I'm looking at these are pixels, let's say. So that's the edge of my object. If that's it at uh, 200 dpi, and there's another object over here at 300 dpi, those scan lines aren't going to match up. And if I look at that up close, I can see a really stair-step jagged image on it. So you should typically be unifying, for lack of a better word, your scan line, your, your resolution. Okay, and one step to do that is when you do create a new document, and you can set this up as part of your custom. If you've got a custom page size of 2436, resolution 200 dpi, and CMYK, and you're going to call it I don't know, banner, poster, whatever. So then if you get a job for a poster, you bring it up, and that's all set for you already. So it's another great way to sort of speed up and, and save a bit of time. 
The other one, and I'm not going to really get into it, but I'll show you the math here and you have the file uh, to try it out later on, is screen calibration. Who here has printed out a job and looked at it and said, well, that text is too big or that text is too small, I better redo it. Okay, I know I've done that. If you calibrate your monitor, this is the way you want to do it. You want to measure your screen, res or check your screen resolution, and mine's 1920 by 1080. Then I'm going to grab a ruler and actually measure my monitor physically measure the horizontal and the vertical. I'm going to divide those values into my screen resolution and I'll come up with two values. From my tools, customization, click on toolbox and zoom and pan. Calibrate rulers. In here is where I'm going to type in those values. Now I don't remember what my numbers are but I'll type those values in there, and then when I click OK, if I draw, if I draw a one inch square, hold the control key down, I'll come up here and I'll tell it I want it one inch. Okay, so I didn't maintain aspect, that's fine. One inch square, zooming to 100%, I should be able to take a ruler and actually measure that right on screen, and it will be one inch. I then know that if I click this file, if I'm looking at it at 100% at here, and I print this file, that's exactly the way it'll be output. So to get an idea as to whether or not you, you've gone um, um, one or not. Uh, there's a question online uh, for, for Justin with respect to uh, whether or not uh, TMS is going to have X7 soon available for yeah. All right. So the question for those online and in the room, as soon as the uh, application is tested internally here, then it will be uh, be available. Okay. Um, grids, rulers, and alignment. Now, object manager we've talked about uh, yesterday. One thing uh, somebody posted on Facebook, I don't remember who it was, uh, an issue printing a PDF file. Uh, printing wasn't available. It was grayed out. If you have, I'm sorry, no, it wasn't printing she was doing, it was uh, publishing to PDF, and published to PDF is grayed out. If you have a layer set to not print, you cannot export. Okay? So if you're trying to export a file out as a JPEG or as a TIFF or a, a PDF, and it's not working, it'll actually be grayed out, or it'll give you a message saying that you've got it set to not print then go into the object manager and make sure you have that layer set to print. I'm just going into my uh, preview here and see. I'm going to jump around this file just because of time. Um, love this. Ah, shop, etc. Uh, oh, we uh, talked yeah. talked yesterday about OLA objects. There's an OLA object right there. So it has that telltale line. If I double click on it, it's actually going to launch Excel for me right now within Corel Draw. And I can go into this cell and do the editing of the, uh, of the file. Once I've done the editing, uh, it's simply a matter of clicking outside. So here we have Excel. It's simply a matter of clicking outside of this window and it kicks me back into Corel Draw. And that's typically how an OLA file works. And that's why it can cause problems. It has those hooks in there. Um, <clears throat> power trace. You guys want to cover power trace? Oh, working with styles. We talked about this uh, quite a bit yesterday. Uh, so here's an example of uh, a style. Um, I've selected that. Oh, let me just uh, create the style first. Export which? If I make a, yes, if I take this file, I've now, I'm now creating two separate styles in here. And if I save this file out and open this file on another system, it will have those two styles there. 
So I'm going to select these two. I haven't tried it this way as one block of text. Now let's uh, apply that style. And we'll apply this style. And there we have it. So it, uh, styles are great, and it's a great way to, to uh, quickly change text and that sort of thing. But just keep a lid on it, keep a handle with it, and it can become a little bit uh, troublesome at times. Um, what do you guys want to see? Power trace. All right, sold. So there's two types of power trace, or there's, there's a couple different uh, um, uh, power trace uh, levels, if you will. Uh, the main one is uh, outline trace. In the outline trace, there's a couple of different settings in here. I'm going to grab clip art. That's the one I use the most. To me, it's, it, it does about the best job. I've gone through this file. Uh, if there's not enough detail in this, I can increase detail. The other thing I can do is take a look at this file. I basically see four colors in here. I see red and black, white and gold. So I'm going to go to my Colors tab, and I can actually come in here and hold down the Shift key to select a range, or I can hold down the Control key, and I can actually merge these colors in here. So let me just grab these two. Also, on the Settings tab, now you'll notice the color shifted. If you have to use a very specific color, and I would imagine for this logo you need a very specific uh, RGB or... or um, AB red. In here, what you'll want to do is select group objects by color. And now if I click OK on this, it's going to go back into Corel Draw. I'll have my vector objects here. And let me just move this out of the way. And I'll ungroup this. I, we have an ungroup and an ungroup all. I want to select ungroup. And now, if I take this red object, this, this red group, if you will, it's all the red in the design. If I'm selecting the gold, it's all the gold in the design. And so now I can easily go into my object manager. This is my gold group. And I can change that to whatever color of gold I want. So I'm doing all of that color at the same time. So make sure you select. Um, uh, group by colors. It'll save an awful lot of time so you don't have to go around and select each individual element in there. Any questions on that? That was a JPEG that I converted to vector. So let's do that again. So I'm going to grab this. That's my vector object. Here's my object, 166 DPI bitmap image. It's a CMYK image. I click on Power Trace, Outline Trace, Clip Art. If I want to, Control plus Alt, click on that. I'm going to put that right down there because I do tracing of bitmaps a lot. So now all I need to do is click on this. It's going to launch Trace for me. It's gone through and it's done the trace. I want to make sure that I select Group Objects by Color. If I need the background in there, then I don't want to remove the background. But in most cases, if we're doing a logo, we typically don't want the background. So I want to delete the background. I also want to delete the original image. I don't need that bitmap anymore. I'm all done with it. Then I'll go on to the Color tab, and I'm going to merge these colors, holding the Control key down, and to select that range. Merge those. I'm not happy with what happened there. I grabbed red and gold together, I think. There we go. And then I'll click OK to this. Once this is finished, because I told it to delete the bitmap, my bitmap image will be gone. I move this out of the way, you can see all I have left is the vector. And this is where I can now go into my object manager and select whatever color I want for these elements. OK? Make sense? Perfect. 
Thank you very much. I'll show you something else right now that I showed last year for the first time to rave reviews. All right. Low quality image. You've got a 72 DPI image that you borrowed off the web. Select your image. I'm going to click on edit bitmap. What that's going to do is it's going to launch photo paint in the background. It'll bring it up with this information or with this file in there. You all have this installed with X6 right now. Uh, it is also with X5. However, it's not active unless you've actually activated it. And it's called Photo Zoom. It's accessed from the file menu. When you access it the first time, you're going to have to log in and register it with that company. Ben Vista is the company name. It's free of charge. You're entitled to use it with your, with your, your version. So from the file menu, I'm going to go down to File Format Plugins, Export, PhotoZoom Pro 2. Uh, with CorelDRAW X7, PhotoZoom Pro 3 is shipping with that. Now, because that's an object with no background, it wants to merge, and that's fine. This application checks for updates when you first launch it. I can zoom in a little bit, and it tells me that it's not going to be the actual size and whatnot. Fairly low quality. In here, this is my print size. This is my resolution. I want 300 DPI. It's gone through, and it's cleaned that right up. OK. I showed this last year, yes. Do you? Yeah. Yeah, so Kat was saying she uses this almost every day. Uh, it's an awesome little application. I've got a 3 by 4 image that I scanned in. Uh, it was printed out, a uh, four-color process, and I've scanned that in, and I have that as a 24, uh, a 20 by 24 on Canvas. It looks pretty cool. Um, so I've done that. Click on Save. Point to where you want it. I'm not going to go JPEG because JPEG is a lossy compression, and I don't want to put more noise into there. So I'm going to go TIFF. It'll give me a little bit larger file size, but I don't care. Uh, JPEG is a lossy compression. And basically, the way the JPEG format works, and I can show it to you, um, it's easier to show it than, than, well, it's not easier to show it than explain it. But um, When you export as a JPEG, uh, a lossy compression, basically what it does is it says, how much quality do you want in this image? If you're not really super picky about high quality, we can drop the quality down. And we do that by removing pixels, removing information. If you're removing information from the file, it's getting smaller, but also the quality is going to suffer. So that's how it makes a smaller file. Uh, so it's a lossy compression. Um, if I now bring this image in, and I probably should have, last year I actually showed the AV logo with the, bird, with the eagle or the bird or whatever that is. The buzzard. Oops. Yes, yes. With photo zoom, because it is a separate application hooked into draw, you do have to save it out of there. So there's my image. We look at the quality on the right versus the one on the left. So the same size, but this is, well, 317 DPI versus my low quality 72 DPI. Now I'll trace that. So it's a great way to fix up a logo and whatnot. All right, uh, we've got about four minutes left. I don't know that I, um, I, I can't really get into another topic, so let me just open it up for questions on the line as well as in the room. Any final questions? Don't open 80 jobs in the first place. <laughs> Sorry. When it's open, when when you uh, sure when uh, depending on that message asking you if you want to open it, it's usually an auto backup exists. Do you want to bring this file open? That's usually what your message is. Screen capture of that if you don't mind and email it to me. Yeah, uh, send me a screen capture of that because something's not right. Okay. 
Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a good, a very good question. The question was with respect to PDF files and getting a file correct error message. Uh, PDF files are poster files, and uh, within CorelDRAW on the disk, we have a utility called Ghost Script. I don't believe it's installed by default. So what you'll want to do is uh, go into your uh, programs here, into the or into the control panel. Windows 8, you've got to love it. Add and remove programs. You're going to select, I'm not going to go there. You're going to select uh, Corel Draw and uh, right click. The option is uninstall change. That's in the troubleshooting document. It, it's in the document on how to get in there to do a, a repair install. But you want, you're basically doing a repair install. So when you do the, the, uh, the uh, install option on the um, Utilities tab, I think it is, there's an option for Ghost Script. And just select that and install it. That's great if you're dealing with EPS, AI, or PS files, PDF files, any type of postscript. So simply install Ghost Script. Um, is there a question on the line of this? Um, yeah, question is there a way to rewatch this? Yes, this, uh, this session is being recorded. And uh, Justin will be posting the links once uh, once that whole file gets processed for, for those that uh, want to review it a second time around. Um, any other questions online, or are there any questions in the room? Sorry? I can't hear that. I don't have a track five. Okay. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, in the room, thank you. I will be around this afternoon if you guys have any questions. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Oh, one more thing. The cards. Feel, feel free to... Thank you.